Hi, welcome to ILTV's Insider. I am Adam Scott Bellos, founder and CEO of the Israel Innovation Fund, and your host for this evening. What's going on in the streets of the Middle East? Well, we are here to discuss all of that. Tonight's topic, Yom HaShoah and the changing image of Israel in the world. After three months of protests uh, in the streets of Tel Aviv, threats from both sides of the political aisle, last night Israel finally began to come back together for the National Week of Mourning until the end of Yom HaZikaron, where we will enter our Independence Day celebrations. Now, earlier today, sirens blared across the country all over the state of Israel, bringing it to a halt as the entire country remembers the lost of the Holocaust nearly eight decades ago. As the world enters a new era where anti-Semitism is at its greatest heights globally, the Jewish people are beginning to see a new world that reminds them of an old one that long thought had disappeared. Currently, it has become acceptable for the leaders of Iran to make public threats against the Jewish people on Twitter and for celebrities to go on week-long tirades propagating anti-Semitic libels. Threats to Jewish students on college campuses outwardly continue to get much worse. In short, it seems that the anti-Semites once again think that the Jewish people's division can give them some strength. We have no idea what's in store for the future, given the escalation that we saw last week. But will Israel be able to preserve through this next round of national challenges? Well, we're here to discuss that tonight. I have two very special guests with me tonight. On my left is David Mayoffice. Right. Uh, did I say that? Yeah, Probably? Said it Wonderful. Correctly. A Israeli digital activist and content creator and influencer who focuses on international affairs as it relates to the Middle East. His content can be found under the tag David underscore Rebel. And on my right, or I'm sorry, my left, is Yirmiyahu Danzig, a Jewish rights and racial justice activist. He's also a digital educator who promotes educational content that can be seen on Instagram and TikTok at that Semite. Thank you both for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have both of you guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. So I'm just going to throw out uh, a couple questions to you guys. I want to kind of bounce things off of you. Um, and we'll, you both work in very similar spaces. I know you, David, just came back from touring uh, the Midwest and, and college campuses, meeting with people pr pretty much across the United States. What did you say? Nine, nine states, states. I've been in, to nine in, states in one week or something like two that? Weeks. In two weeks. Absolutely insane. So I, I, one of you can pick this up. Do you guys think over the last three months Israel's enemies have been emboldened only because of the national tension internally that's going on? Do you think that, that it's become this open game season now for Israel's enemies? Yirmiyahu, I'll let you start. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to deny that it has become that. Uh, part of the rhetoric that has really defined uh, Hezbollah, Iran, but also Hamas for the past few decades has been that Israel is an unnatural presence in the Middle East. And as an unnatural presence, really, they can contribute to making the Jews bleed. But ultimately, if we just let them to their own devices, the Jews will pick each other apart. Um, and what we saw, particularly over the past uh, weeks, is that rhetoric coming out of Hassan Nasrallah, but also out of Beirut in general, saying, hey, look, the collapse is happening. What we said is going to happen is happening. We just need to uh, pay attention and seize the opportunity to contribute to the downfall. But don't you think that I mean, as soon as rockets were fired from the north via Hamas, it, you know, the opposition quickly stated we're behind the government in whatever it takes. It, it was very clear that we were going to be putting the problems that we've had over the last couple of weeks aside to fix this. And we didn't let the escalation, you know, continue. What, what do you think about that? I think when it comes to, first of all, when it comes to Iran and their proxies such as Hezbollah and Hamas, they definitely use every chance to threaten Israel. So do you think this was more Iran asking Hamas to do this than Hamas? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We need to treat them as Iranian proxy, so uh, the um, Islamic regime stands behind it. So they use every chance to threat Israel and uh, certain divideness in Israel society that definitely are jumping on it. When it comes to, um, uh, to Israel, it's, it's not surprising that we are always united um, because of the threat that we have. And once rocket hits Israel, we are united, no matter both left, right. Were you surprised how quickly everybody dropped, you know, the, the baggage of the last three months? I, I wasn't because I feel like, you know, Minister Dermer has a great saying, my, my history goes farther than the breakfast I ate this mm. morning. And I feel like people forget the actual national challenges that this country has endured for the last, you know, 75 years. So I, I personally was not surprised, but I feel like the entire Western world is somewhat surprised. 
I think the unifying ethos of Israeli society never ceases to astound not only the West, but also Israelis. Uh, the problem is, is that when we get into a habit of needing to be slapped in the face in order to take a defensive posture, mm -hmm. at some point you're just going to get knocked out. So I'm very concerned about the developments right now. I think we're, the polarization in Israeli society is as highest, at least since the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and if we want to be uh, equipped to deal with a growing coalition of Iran and its proxies, mm -hmm. then we need to wake up, because we're not dealing with this in an appropriate fashion. Do you think it's inappropriate? I mean, obviously it's inappropriate, but you know, David, then Yermiahu, I'd love to hear your thoughts. The president of Iran today, they had the National Army Day, which, which coincides with Yom HaShoah today. And he said, I, we are going to wipe Haifa and Tel Aviv off the map, I'm paraphrasing right now, uh, if anything is done towards Iran in the near future. What do you think that says to make such a publicly, you know, bold statement on a, on a day like Yom HaShoah for Iran um, after, after 300 rockets were fired? I think they're not um, afraid anymore as they were because they saw, as I said, the divideness and they're checking what's, what's going to be the red line for Israel. It always starts with the statements and ends with the rockets. And the threat is that Iran has thousands. We're basically going through two weeks of Jewish propaganda of nationality and nationhood and identity building. But I, I'm, I'm still perplexed as to why they would think these type of statements won't embolden us to go back to ourselves, if that makes sense. Would you, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, well, I think that, and this, is, this speaks to a lot of the core of what's been happening in the past few months in Israeli political discourse, that when things get really difficult, not only from external threats, but also internally, because let's just, let's face it, right, the economic reality continues to be challenging in Israel. Um, we have plenty of uh, social uh, separations within our society that need to be healed. Um, and a lot of statements coming out of certain sectors of Israeli society saying that if things get too bad, so to speak, mm -hmm. we will leave, that doesn't just put us in a position where we might have a trouble, we might have problems. Uh, uniting against a, an outside threat, it gives our enemies more ammunition to say, hey, at a time when they are supposed to be the most united, this is what we need to keep up the heat, and this is what we're seeing today in Yom Shoah. So do you think it was a mistake firing 300 rockets right before Passover? Definitely I mean, it was a mistake. It's, it's always a mistake. And no, I, not a mistake, but a mistake in terms of they were trying to leverage our division, and instead they pushed us closer together. Do you think that that was something that they expected? By, by the way, they uh, they thought about this, and they and they told that it's gonna be it's gonna be a mistake to start the war now because they will be um, united once again. So mm -hmm. that's basically what happens, and every time it happens. Well, I, I think one of the most interesting things over the last couple of months, and, and obviously now leading into Yom HaShoah and then Yom Hazikaron and Yom Atzmaut, is that when you looked at what was going on in the world, one of the things that was brought up on this program, uh, actually two weeks in a row were the protests in France over the rise in the retirement age by two years, and people were burning cafes. But there was no violence, there was no damage here in Israel, yet the only thing in the Western media was that Israel was losing its democracy. Then all of a sudden rockets fire on us, and now all of a sudden we're back to being the strong country that we once were. I find it to be rather... It's an obsession. It, it is it's an, an obsession, obsession. It's in, in the Western you, media with Israel. Absolutely. Would you agree with that? Look, it's, it's very difficult to, at the one hand, uh, look at France burning cafes, but at the other hand, you know, we might not be seeing the same type of violence in the streets. Do you think the baguettes are good and toasted after the cafe? <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. You know. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, sure, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the cafe owners wouldn't, uh, wouldn't appreciate that. I hope that. they're insured. <laughs> but uh, I, I, look, when, I don't think we should minimize, as Israelis, I don't mm -hmm. think we should, and supporters of Israel abroad, mm -hmm. I don't think we should minimize uh, the fact that a lot of Across, not, this isn't a left or right issue. Across the spectrum, we've heard too much over the past few months the use of the phrase uh, civil war. And, right? and, and us or them. Right. And, and again, we, we've been through so much mm -hmm. as a country from before the founding of the state until we this point. We haven't heard of a calling of a civil war since Kahana post six day war when he wanted to establish the sovereign state of Judea. I mean, it's a very good point that you're making. I, when was the last time? In Israeli history, somebody called for a civil war in Israeli society. Well, I think the only two times that really come to mind is the example you just brought, but also... We know the news is volatile and fast-paced, and we want to let you know that ITV's new app is now available. So if you want to stay connected to the latest news from Israel, the Middle East, and the Jewish world, download our app now on all your devices. It's available in the App Store for both Android and iPhone.